The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham Read by Richard Bryars The mole had been working very hard all the morning, spring-cleaning his little home, first with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs, with a brush and a pail of whitewash, till he had dust in his throat and eyes and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above and in the earth below and around him, penetrating even his dark and lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. It was small wonder, then, that he suddenly flung down his brush on the floor, said, Bother! and, Oh, blow! and also, Hang spring cleaning! and bolted out of the house without even waiting to put on his coat. Something up above was calling him imperiously, and he made for the steep little tunnel which answered in his case to the gravelled carriage drive owned by animals whose residences are nearer to the sun and air. So he scraped and scratched and scrabbled and scrooged, and then he scrooged again and scrabbled and scratched and scraped, working busily with his little paws and muttering to himself, Up we go! Up we go! Till at last, pop! His snout came out into the sunlight and he found himself rolling in the warm grass of a great meadow. This is fine, he said to himself. This is better than whitewashing. Jumping off all his four legs at once in the joy of living and the delight of spring, without his cleaning, he pursued his way across the meadow till he reached the hedge on the further side. Hold up, said an elderly rabbit at the gap. Sixpence for the privilege of passing by the private road. He was bowled over in an instant by the impatient and contemptuous mole who trotted along the side of the hedge, chaffing the other rabbits as they peeped hurriedly from their holes to see what the row was about. Onion sauce! Onion sauce! he remarked jeeringly, and was gone before they could think of a thoroughly satisfactory reply. It all seemed too good to be true. Hither and thither through the meadows he rambled busily, along the hedgerows, across the copses, finding everywhere birds building, flowers budding, leaves thrusting, everything happy and progressive and occupied. And instead of having an uneasy conscience pricking him and whispering, whitewash, he somehow could only feel how jolly it was to be the only idle dog among all these busy citizens. He thought his happiness was complete when, as he meandered aimlessly along, suddenly he stood by the edge of a full-fed river. Never in his life had he seen a river before. This sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal, chasing and chuckling, gripping things with a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh to fling itself on fresh playmates that shook themselves free and were caught and held again. All was a shake and a shiver, glints and gleams and sparkles, rustle and swirl, chatter and bubble. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. As he sat on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye, and dreamily he fell to considering what a nice, snug dwelling place it would make for an animal with few wants and fond of a bijou riverside residence above flood level and remote from noise and dust. As he gazed, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, vanished, then twinkled once more like a tiny star. Then, as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye, and a small face began gradually to grow up round it, like a frame round a picture, a brown little face with whiskers, a grave round face with the same twinkle in its eye that at first attracted his notice, small neat ears and thick silky hair. It was the water rat. Then the two animals stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hello, Mole, said the water rat. Hello, rat, said the Mole. Would you like to come over? inquired the rat presently. The rat stooped and unfastened a rope and hauled on it, then lightly stepped into a little boat which the Mole had not observed. It was painted blue outside and white within, 
and was just the size for two animals, and the mole's whole heart went out to it at once, even though he did not yet fully understand its uses. The rat scowled smartly across and made fast. Then he held up his forepaw as the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Now then, step lively. And the mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated in the stern of a real boat. This has been a wonderful day, said he, as the rat shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know, I've never been in a boat before in all my life. What? cried the rat, open-mouthed. Never been in a... You never... Well, I... What have you been doing, then? Is it so nice as all that? asked the mole shyly, though he was quite prepared to believe it as he leaned back in his seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, and all the fascinating fittings and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Nice? It's the only thing, said the water rat solemnly as he leaned forward for his stroke. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing, he went on dreamily, messing about in boats. Messing. Look ahead, rat, cried the mole suddenly. It was too late. The boat struck the bank full tilt. The dreamer, the joyous oarsman, lay on his back at the bottom of the boat, his heels in the air. About in boats. Or with boats, the rat went on composedly, picking himself up with a pleasant laugh. In or out of them, it doesn't matter. Nothing seems really to matter, that's the charm of it. Look here, if you've really nothing else on hand this morning, supposing we drop down the river together and have a long day of it. The mole waggled his toes from sheer happiness, spread his chest with a sigh of full contentment, and leaned back blissfully into the soft cushions. What a day I'm having, he said. Let us start at once. Hold hard a minute, then, said the rat. He looped the painter through a ring in his landing stage, climbed up into his hole above, and after a short interval reappeared, staggering under a fat wicker luncheon basket. Shove that under your feet, he observed to the mole as he passed it down into the boat. Then he untied the painter and took the skulls again. What's inside it? asked the mole, wriggling with curiosity. There's cold chicken inside it, replied the rat briefly. Cold tongue, cold ham, cold beef, pickled gherkins, salad, French rolls, cress sandwiches, potted meat, ginger beer, lemonade, soda water. Oh, stop, stop, cried the mole in ecstasies. This is too much. Do you really think so? inquired the rat seriously. It's only what I always take on these little excursions, and the other animals are always telling me that I'm a mean beast and cut it very fine. The mole never heard a word he was saying. Absorbed in the new life he was entering upon, intoxicated with the sparkle, the ripple, the scents and the sounds and the sunlight, he trailed a paw in the water and dreamed long waking dreams. The water rat, like the good little fellow he was, sculled steadily on and forbore to disturb him. "'I like your clothes awfully, old chap,' he remarked after some half-hour or so had passed. I'm going to get a black velvet smoking suit myself some day, as soon as I can afford it. I beg your pardon, said the mole, pulling himself together with an effort. You must think me very rude, but all this is so new to me. So this is a river. The river, corrected the rat. And you really live by the river? What a jolly life. By it and with it and on it and in it, said the rat. It's brother and sister to me, and aunts, and company, and food and drink, and, naturally, washing. It's my world, and I don't want any other. What it hasn't got is not worth having, and what it doesn't know is not worth knowing. Lord, the times we've had together. Whether in winter or summer, spring or autumn, it's always got its fun and its excitement. But isn't it a bit dull at times? The mole ventured to ask. Just you and the river and no one else to pass a word with? No one else to... Well, I mustn't be hard on you, said the rat with forbearance. You're new to it and, of course, you don't know. The bank is so crowded nowadays that many people are moving away altogether. Oh, no, it isn't what it used to be at all. Otters, kingfishers, dab chicks, moorhens, all of them about all day long and always wanting you to do something. 
as if a fellow had no business of his own to attend to. What lies over there? asked the Mole, waving a paw towards a background of woodland that darkly framed the water meadows on one side of the river. That, oh, that's just the wild wood, said the Rat shortly. We don't go there very much, we river bankers. Aren't they, aren't they very nice people in there? said the Mole a trifle nervously. Well, replied the Rat, let me see, the squirrels are all right, and and the rabbits, some of them, but rabbits are a mixed lot. And then there's Badger, of course. He lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else either if you paid him to do it. Dear old Badger, nobody interferes with him. They'd better not. And beyond the wild wood again? The mole asked. Beyond the wild wood comes the wide world, said the rat. And that's something that doesn't matter either to you or me. I've never been there and I'm never going, nor you either, if you've got any sense at all. Now then, here's our backwater at last, where we're going to lunch. Leaving the main stream, they now passed into what seemed at first sight like a little landlocked lake. Green turf sloped down to either edge, brown snaky tree roots gleamed below the surface of the quiet water, while ahead of them the silvery shoulder and foamy tumble of a weir arm in arm with a restless dripping mill wheel, filled the air with a soothing murmur of sound. It was so very beautiful that the mole could only hold up both forepaws and gasp, Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! The rat brought the boat alongside the bank, made her fast, helped the still awkward mole safely ashore, and swung out the luncheon basket. The mole begged as a favour to be allowed to unpack it all by himself, and the rat was very pleased to indulge him and to sprawl at full length on the grass and rest, while his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it, took out all the mysterious packets one by one, and arranged their contents in due order, still gasping, Oh my! Oh my! at each fresh revelation. When all was ready, the rat said, Now pitch in, old fella! And the mole was indeed very glad to obey, for he had started his spring cleaning at a very early hour that morning, as people will do, and had not paused for bite or sup. "'What are you looking at?' said the Rat presently. "'I am looking,' said the Mole, "'at a streak of bubbles that I see travelling along the surface of the water.' "'Bubbles?' "'Oh, oh,' said the Rat, and chirruped cheerily in an inviting sort of way. A broad, glistening muzzle showed itself above the edge of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and shook the water from his coat. Oh, greedy beggars, he observed, making for the provender. Why didn't you invite me, Ratty? This was an impromptu affair, explained the rat. By the way, my friend, Mr. Mole. Proud, I'm sure, said the otter, and the two animals were friends forthwith. Such a rumpus everywhere, continued the otter. All the world seems out on the river today. I came up this backwater to try and get a moment's peace, and then stumble upon you fellows. There was a rustle behind them from a hedge, and a stripy head with high shoulders behind it peered forth on them. Come on, old badger, shouted the rat. The badger trotted forward a pace or two, then grunted, mm, company, and turned his back and disappeared from view. That's just the sort of fellow he is, observed the disappointed rat. Simply hates society. Now we shan't see any more of him today. Well, tell us, who's out on the river? Toad's out, for one, replied the otter, in his brand new boat, new togs, new everything. The two animals looked at each other and laughed. <laughs> Once it was nothing but sailing, said the rat. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Nothing would please him but to punt all day and every day, and a nice mess he made of it. Last year it was houseboating, and we all had to go and stay with him in his houseboat and pretend we liked it. He was going to spend the rest of his life in a houseboat. It's all the same, whatever he takes up. He gets tired of it and starts on something fresh. Such a good fellow, too, remarked the otter reflectively. But no stability, especially in a boat. An errant mayfly swerved unsteadily athwart the current. A swirl of water and a cloop, and the mayfly was visible no more. Neither was the otter, but again there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the river. Well, well, said the rat, 
I suppose we ought to be moving. I wonder which of us had better pack the luncheon basket. He did not speak as if he was frightfully eager for the treat. Oh, please, let me, said the mole. So, of course, the rat let him. Packing the basket was not quite such pleasant work as unpacking the basket. It never is. But the mole was bent on enjoying everything, and although just when he had got the basket packed and strapped up tightly, he saw a plate staring up at him from the grass, and when the job had been done again, the rat pointed out a fork which anybody ought to have seen, and last of all behold the mustard pot, which he had been sitting on without knowing it, still somehow the thing got finished at last, without much loss of temper. The afternoon sun was getting low, as the rat sculled gently homewards in a dreamy mood. But the mole, already quite at home in a boat, so he thought, was getting a bit restless, and presently he said, Ratty, please, I want to row now. The rat shook his head with a smile. Not yet, my young friend, he said. Wait till you have had a few lessons. It's not so easy as it looks. The mole was quiet for a minute or two, but he began to feel more and more jealous of Rat, sculling so strongly and so easily along, and his pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the sculls so suddenly that the Rat, who was gazing out over the water, was taken by surprise and fell backwards off his seat with his legs in the air for the second time. "'Stop it, you silly ass!' cried the Rat from the bottom of the boat. "'You'll have us over!' The mole flung his skulls back with a flourish and made a great dig at the water. He missed the surface altogether. His legs flew up above his head, and he found himself lying on the top of the prostrate rat. Greatly alarmed, he made a grab at the side of the boat, and the next moment, sploosh, over went the boat, and he found himself struggling in the river. Oh, my! How cold the water was, and oh, how very wet it felt! how it sang in his ears as he went down, 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 how bright and welcome the sun looked as he rose to the surface, coughing and spluttering, how black was his despair when he felt himself sinking again. Then a firm paw gripped him by the back of his neck. It was the rat, and he was evidently laughing. The mole could feel him laughing, right down his arm and through his paw and so into his, the mole's, neck. The rat got hold of a skull and shoved it under the mole's arm. Then he did the same by the other side of him, and swimming behind, propelled the helpless animal to shore, hauled him out, and set him down on the bank, a squashy, pulpy lump of misery. When the rat had rubbed him down a bit and wrung some of the wet out of him, he said, Now then, old fellow, trot up and down the towing path as hard as you can till you're warm and dry again, while I dive for the luncheon basket. So the dismal mole trotted about till he was fairly dry, while the rat plunged into the water again, recovered the boat, righted her and made her fast, fetched his floating property to shore by degrees, and finally dived successfully for the luncheon basket and struggled to land with it. When all was ready for a start once more, the mole, limp and dejected, took his seat in the stern of the boat, and as they set off he said, Ratty, my generous friend, I am very sorry indeed for my foolish and ungrateful conduct. I have been a complete ass, and I know it. Will you overlook it this once and forgive me and let things go on as before? That's all right, bless you, responded the rat cheerily. What's a little wet to a water rat? Don't you think any more about it? And look here, I really think you'd better come and stop with me for a little time. It's very plain and rough, you know, but I can make you comfortable, and I'll teach you to row and to swim, and you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. The mole was so touched by his kind manner of speaking that he could find no voice to answer him, and he had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. But the rat kindly looked in another direction, and presently the mole's spirits revived again. When they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlour, and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it, having fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him, and told him river stories till supper time. Supper was a most cheerful meal, but very shortly afterwards a terribly sleepy mole had to be escorted upstairs by his considerate host to the best bedroom, where he soon laid his head on his pillow in great peace and contentment, knowing that his new-found friend, the river, was lapping the sill of his window. 
Ratty, said the Mole suddenly, one bright summer morning, if you please, I want to ask you a favour. Won't you take me to call on Mr. Toad? I've heard so much about him, and I do so want to make his acquaintance. Why, certainly, said the good-natured Rat. Get the boat out and we'll paddle up there at once. It's never the wrong time to call on Toad. Early or late, he's always the same fellow. Always good-tempered, always glad to see you, always sorry when you go. He must be a very nice animal, observed the Mole, as he got into the boat and took the skulls, while the Rat settled himself comfortably in the stern. He is indeed the best of animals, replied Rat. So simple, so good-natured and so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever, we can't all be geniuses, and it may be that he is both boastful and conceited, but he has got some great qualities, has Toadie. Rounding a bend in the river, they came in sight of a handsome, dignified old house of mellowed red brick, with well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. There's Toad Hall, said the Rat, and that creek on the left, where the notice board says, Private, no landing allowed, leads to his boathouse, where we leave the boat. The stables are over there to the right. That's the banqueting hall you're looking at now. Very old, that is. Toad is rather rich, you know, and this is really one of the nicest houses in these parts, though we never admit as much to Toad. They glided up the creek, and the mole shipped his skulls as they passed into the shadow of a large boathouse. Here they saw many handsome boats, slung from the crossbeams or hauled up on a slip, but none in the water and the place had an unused and a deserted air. The rat looked around him. I understand, said he. Boating is played out. He's tired of it and done with it. I wonder what new fad he has taken up now. We shall hear all about it quite soon enough. They disembarked and strolled across the gay flower-decked lawns in search of Toad, whom they presently happened upon, resting in a wicker garden chair with a preoccupied expression of face and a large map spread out on his knees. Hooray! he cried, jumping up on seeing them. This is splendid! He shook the paws of both of them warmly, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you! he went on, dancing around them. I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once, whatever you were doing. I want you badly, both of you. Now, what will you take? Come inside and have something. You don't know how lucky it is you're turning up just now. You've got to help me. It's most important. It's about your rowing, I suppose, said the Rat, with an innocent air. Well, you're getting on fairly well, though you splash a good bit still. With a great deal of patience and any quantity of coaching, you may... Oh, poo! Boating! interrupted the Toad in great disgust. Silly boyish amusement. I've given that up long ago. Sheer waste of time, that's what it is. No, I've discovered the real thing. The only genuine occupation for a lifetime. I propose to devote the remainder of mine to it and can only regret the wasted years that lie behind me squandered in trivialities. Come in there, dear Ratty, and your amiable friend also, if you'll be so very good. Just as far as the stable yard, and you shall see what you shall see. <laughs> he led the way to the stable yard, the Rat following with a most mistrustful expression. And there, drawn out of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted a canary yellow, picked out with green and red wheels. There you are! cried the toad, straddling and expanding himself. There's real life for you, embodied in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling downs, here today, up and off to somewhere else tomorrow. Travel, change, interest, excitement, the whole world before you, and a horizon that's always changing. And mind, this is the very finest cart of its sort that was ever built, without any exception. Come inside and look at the arrangements. Planned them all myself, I did. The mole was tremendously interested and excited and followed him eagerly up the steps and into the interior of the caravan. The rat only snorted and thrust his hands deep into his pockets, remaining where he was. It was indeed very compact and comfortable. Little sleeping bunks, a little table that folded up against the wall, a cooking stove, lockers, bookshelves, a bird cage with a bird in it, and pots, pans, jugs, and kettles of every size and variety. All complete, said the toad triumphantly, pulling open the locker. You see, 
Biscuits, potted lobster, sardines, everything you can possibly want. Soda water here, backy there, letter paper, bacon, jam, cards and dominoes. You'll find that nothing whatever has been forgotten when we make our start this afternoon. I uh, beg your pardon, said the rat slowly as he chewed a straw. But did I overhear you say something about we and start and this afternoon? Now, you dear good old ratty, said Toad imploringly, don't begin talking in that stiff and sniffy sort of way, because you know you've got to come. I can't possibly manage without you, so please consider it settled and don't argue. It's the one thing I can't stand. You surely don't mean to stick to your dull, fusty old river all your life and just live in a hole in a bank and boat? <laughs> I want to show you the world. I don't care, said the rat doggedly. I'm not coming and that's flat. And I am going to stick to my old river and live in a hole and boat, as I've always done. And what's more, Mole was going to stick to me and do as I do, aren't you, Mole? Of course I am, said the Mole loyally. All the same, it sounds as if it might have been, well, rather fun, you know. The rat saw what was passing in his mind and wavered. He hated disappointing people, and he was fond of the mole and would do almost anything to oblige him. Toad was watching both of them closely. During luncheon, which was excellent, of course, as everything at Toad Hall always was, the toad simply let himself go. Disregarding the rat, he proceeded to play upon the inexperienced mole as on a harp. He painted the prospects of the trip and the joys of the open life and the roadside in such glowing colours that the mole could hardly sit in his chair for excitement. Somehow it soon seemed taken for granted by all three of them that the trip was a settled thing, and the rat, though still unconvinced in his mind, allowed his good nature to override his personal objections. He could not bear to disappoint his two friends, who were already deep in schemes and anticipations, planning out each day's separate occupation for several weeks ahead. When they were quite ready, the now triumphant Toad led his companions to the paddock and set them to capture the old grey horse, who, without having been consulted, and to his own extreme annoyance, had been told off by Toad for the dustiest job in this dusty expedition. He frankly preferred the paddock, and took a deal of catching. Meantime, Toad packed the lockers still tighter with necessaries and hung nosebags, nets of onions, bundles of hay and baskets from the bottom of the cart. At last the horse was caught and harnessed and they set off, all talking at once, each animal either trudging by the side of the cart or sitting on the shaft as the humour took him. It was a golden afternoon. The smell of the dust they kicked up was rich and satisfying. Out of thick orchards on either side of the road, birds called and whistled to them cheerily. Good-natured wayfarers passing them gave them good day, or stopped to say nice things about their beautiful cart, and rabbits sitting at their front doors in the hedgerows held up their forepaws and said, Oh my, oh my, oh my! Late in the evening, tired and happy and miles from home, they drew up on a remote common turned the horse loose to graze, and ate their simple supper sitting on the grass by the side of the cart. Toad talked big about all he was going to do in the days to come, while stars grew fuller and larger all around them, and a yellow moon, appearing suddenly and silently from nowhere in particular, came to keep them company and listen to their talk. At last they turned in to their little bunks in the cart, and Toad, kicking out his legs, sleepily said, Well, good night, you fellas. This is a real life for a gentleman. Talk about your old river. After so much open air and excitement, the toad slept very soundly, and no amount of shaking could rouse him out of bed next morning. So while the rat saw to the horse and lit a fire and cleaned last night's cups and platters and got things ready for breakfast, the mole trudged off to the nearest village, a long way off, for milk and eggs and various necessaries the toad had, of course, forgotten to provide.
the hard work had all been done and the two animals were resting, thoroughly exhausted, by the time Toad appeared on the scene, fresh and gay, remarking what a pleasant, easy life it was they were all leading now, after the cares and worries and fatigues of housekeeping at home. They had a pleasant ramble that day over grassy downs and along narrow by-lanes and camped, as before, on a common, only this time the two guests took care that Toad should do his fair share of work. In consequence, when the time came for starting next morning, Toad was by no means so rapturous about the simplicity of the primitive life. Their way lay, as before, across country by narrow lanes, and it was not till the afternoon that they came out on the high road, their first high road, and there disaster, fleet and unforeseen, sprang out on them. They were strolling along the high road easily, the mole by the horse's head talking to him, since the horse had complained that he was being frightfully left out of it, and nobody considered him in the least. The toad and the water rat walking behind the cart, talking together, at least toad was talking, and rat was saying at intervals, Yes, precisely, and uh, what did you say to him? And thinking all the time of something very different, when far behind them they heard a faint warning hum, like the drone of a distant bee. Glancing back, they saw a small cloud of dust, with a dark centre of energy, advancing on them at incredible speed, while from out the dust a faint poop, poop, wailed like an uneasy animal in pain. Hardly regarding it, they turned to resume their conversation, when in an instant, as it seemed, the peaceful scene was changed, and with a blast of wind and a whirl of sound that made them jump for the nearest ditch, it was on them. The poop, poop rang with a brazen shout in their ears. They had a moment's glimpse of an interior of glittering plate glass and rich Morocco, and the magnificent motor car, immense, breath-snatching, passionate, with his pilot tense, hugging his wheel, possessed all earth and air for the fraction of a second, flung an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly, and then dwindled to a speck in the far distance, changed back into a droning bee once more. Rearing, plunging, backing steadily, in spite of all the mole's efforts at his head and all the mole's lively language directed at his better feelings, the old grey horse drove the cart backwards towards the deep ditch at the side of the road. It wavered an instant, then there was a heart-rending crash, and the canary-coloured cart, their pride and their joy, lay on its side in the ditch, an irredeemable wreck. The rat danced up and down in the road, simply transported with passion. You villains! he shouted, shaking both fists. You scoundrels, you highwaymen, you, you road hogs! I'll have the law on you! I'll report you! I'll take you through all the courts! Toad sat straight down in the middle of the dusty road, his legs stretched out before him, and stared fixedly in the direction of the disappearing motor car. He breathed short. His face wore a placid, satisfied expression, and at intervals he faintly murmured, Poop! Poop! The mole was busy trying to quiet the horse, which he succeeded in doing after a time. Then he went to look at the cart on its side in the ditch. It was indeed a sorry sight. Panels and windows smashed, axles hopelessly bent, one wheel off, sardine tins scattered over the wide world, and the bird in the birdcage sobbing pitifully and calling to be let out. The rat came to help him, but their united efforts were not sufficient to right the cart. Hi, Toad, they cried. Come and bear a hand, can't you? The Toad never answered a word or budged from his seat in the road, so they went to see what was the matter with him. They found him in a sort of trance, a happy smile on his face, his eyes still fixed on the dusty wake of their destroyer. At intervals, he was still heard to murmur, Poop! Poop! The rat shook him by the shoulder. Are you coming to help us, Toad? He demanded sternly. Glorious, stirring sight, murmured Toad, never offering to move. The poetry of motion, the real way to travel, the only way to travel, here today, in next week tomorrow. Villages skipped, Towns and cities jumped. Oh, bliss! Oh, poop, poop! 
Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, stop being an ass, Toad, cried the Mole despairingly. And to think I never knew, never even dreamed, but now, but now that I know, now that I fully realize, oh, what dust clouds shall spring up behind me as I speed on my reckless way, what carts I shall fling carelessly into the ditch in the wake of my magnificent onset. Horrid little carts, common carts, canary-coloured carts. What are we to do with him? asked the mole of the water rat. Nothing at all, replied the rat firmly, because there is really nothing to be done. He is now possessed. He has got a new craze, and it always takes him that way in its first stage. He'll continue like this for days now, quite useless for all practical purposes. Never mind him. Let's go and see what there is to be done about the cart. A careful inspection showed them that even if they succeeded in writing it by themselves, the cart would travel no longer. The axles were in a hopeless state, and the missing wheel was shattered into pieces. The rat knotted the horse's reins over his back and took him by the head, carrying the birdcage and its hysterical occupant in the other hand. Come on, he said grimly to the mole. It's five or six miles to the nearest town, and we shall just have to walk it. The sooner we make a start, the better. But what about Toad? asked the Mole anxiously as they set off together. We can't leave him here, sitting in the middle of the road by himself, in the distracted state he's in. It's not safe, supposing another thing were to come along. Oh, bother, Toad, said the Rat savagely. I've done with him. They had not proceeded very far on their way, however, when there was a pattering of feet behind them, and Toad caught them up and thrust a paw inside the elbow of each of them, still breathing short and staring into vacancy. "'Now look here, Toad,' said the Rat sharply. "'As soon as we get to the town, you'll have to go straight to the police station and see if they know anything about that motor car and who it belongs to and lodge a complaint against it. Then you'll have to go to a blacksmith's or a wheelwright's and arrange for the car to be fetched and mended and put to rights. And meanwhile, Mole and I will go to an inn and find comfortable rooms where we can stay till the cart's ready.' Police station. Complaint, murmured Toad dreamily. Me complain of that beautiful, that heavenly vision that has been vouchsafed to me. Mend the cart. I've done with carts forever. I never want to see the cart or to hear of it again. Oh, Ratty, you can't think how obliged I am to you for consenting to come on this trip. I wouldn't have gone without you, and then I might never have heard that entrancing sound or smell that bewitching smell. I owe it all to you, my best of friends. The rat turned from him in despair. You see what it is, he said to the mole, addressing him across Toad's head. He's quite helpless. On reaching the town, they went straight to the station and deposited Toad in the second-class waiting room, giving a porter tuppence to keep a strict eye on him. They then left the horse at an inn stable and gave what directions they could about the cart and its contents. Eventually, a slow train, having landed them at a station not very far from Toad Hall, they escorted the spellbound, sleepwalking Toad to his door, put him inside it, and instructed his housekeeper to feed him, undress him, and put him to bed. Then they got out their boat from the boathouse, sculled down the river home, and at a very late hour sat down to supper in their own cosy riverside parlour, to the rat's great joy and contentment. The following evening the mole, who had risen late and taken things very easy all day, was sitting on the bank fishing when the rat came to find him. Heard the news? he said. There's nothing else being talked about all along the river bank. Toad went up to town by an early train this morning, and he has ordered a large and very expensive motor car. The Mole had long wanted to make the acquaintance of the Badger. He seemed, by all accounts, to be such an important personage, and though rarely visible, to make his unseen influence felt by everybody about the place. But whenever the Mole mentioned his wish to the Water Rat, he always found himself put off. It's all right, the Rat would say. Badger'll turn up some day or other. It's always turning up, and then I'll introduce you. 
the best of fellows, but you must not only take him as you find him, but when you find him. Couldn't you ask him here, dinner or something? said the mole. He wouldn't come, replied the rat simply. Badger hates society, and invitations, and dinner, and all that sort of thing. Well, then, supposing we go and call on him? Oh, I'm sure he wouldn't like that at all, said the rat. He's so very shy, he'd be sure to be offended. Besides, he lives in the very middle of the wild wood. Well, supposing he does, said the mole. You told me the wild wood was all right, you know. Oh, I know, I know, uh, so it is, replied the rat evasively. But I think we won't go there just now, not just yet. It's a long way, and he wouldn't be at home at this time of year anyhow, and he'll be coming along some day, if you'll wait quietly. The mole had to be content with this. But the badger never came along, and every day brought its amusements, and it was not till summer was long over, and cold and frost and miry ways kept them much indoors, and the swollen river raced past outside the windows with a speed that mocked at boating of any sort or kind, that he found his thoughts dwelling again with much persistence on the solitary grey badger. And so, one afternoon, when the rat was dozing in his armchair before the fire, he formed the resolution to go out by himself and explore the wild wood and perhaps strike up an acquaintance with Mr. Badger. It was a cold, still afternoon with a hard, steely sky overhead when he slipped out of the warm parlour into the open air. There was nothing to alarm him at first entry into the wild wood. Twigs crackled under his feet, logs tripped him, funguses on stumps resembled caricatures and startled him for the moment by their likeness to something familiar and far away, but that was all fun and exciting. It led him on, and he penetrated to where the light was less, and trees crouched nearer and nearer, and holes made ugly mouths at him on either side. Everything was very still now. The dusk advanced on him steadily, rapidly, gathering in behind and before, and the light seemed to be draining away like flood water. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder and indistinctly that he first thought he saw a face, a little evil wedge-shaped face looking out at him from a hole. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace, telling himself cheerfully not to begin imagining things or there would be simply no end to it. He passed another hole and another and another and then, yes, no, yes, certainly, a little narrow face with hard eyes had flashed up for an instant from a hole and was gone. He hesitated, braced himself up for an effort, and strode on. Then, suddenly, as if it had been so all the time, every hole, far and near, and there were hundreds of them, seemed to possess its face, coming and going rapidly, all fixing on him glances of malice and hatred, all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. If he could only get away from the holes in the bank, he thought, there would be no more faces. He swung off the path and plunged into the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint and shrill it was, and far behind him when he first heard it, but somehow it made him hurry forward. Then, still very faint and shrill, it sounded far ahead of him and made him hesitate and want to go back. Then the pattering began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first, then as it grew it took a regular rhythm, and he knew it for nothing else but the pat, pat, pat of little feet still a very long way off. Was it in front or behind? It seemed to be first one and then the other, then both. It grew and it multiplied, till from every quarter, as he listened anxiously, leaning this way and that, it seemed to be closing in on him. The pattering increased till it sounded like sudden hail on the dry leaf carpet spread around him. The whole wood seemed running now, running hard, hunting, chasing, closing in round something, or somebody. In panic he began to run too, aimlessly, he knew not whither. He ran up against things, he fell over things and into things, he darted under things and dodged round things. 
At last he took refuge in the deep, dark hollow of an old beech tree which offered shelter, concealment, perhaps even safety. But who could tell? Anyhow, he was too tired to run any further, and could only snuggle down into the dry leaves which had drifted into the hollow and hope he was safe for a time. And as he lay there, panting and trembling, and listened to the whistlings and the patterings outside, he knew it at last, in all its fullness, that dread thing which other little dwellers in field and hedgerow had encountered here and known as their darkest moment, that thing which the rat had vainly tried to shield him from, the terror of the wild wood. Meanwhile, the rat, warm and comfortable, dozed by his fireside. Then a coal slipped, the fire crackled and sent up a spurt of flame, and he woke with a start. He looked round for the mole, but the mole was not there. He listened for a time. The house seemed very quiet. Then he called, Mole, several times, and receiving no answer, got up and went into the hall. The mole's cap was missing from its accustomed peg. His galoshes, which always lay by the umbrella stand, were also gone. The rat left the house and carefully examined the muddy surface of the ground outside, hoping to find the mole's tracks. There they were, sure enough, running along straight and purposeful, leading direct to the wild wood. The rat looked very grave and stood in deep thought for a moment or two. Then he re-entered the house, strapped a belt round his waist, shoved a brace of pistols into it, took up a stout cudgel that stood in the corner of the hall, and set off for the wild wood at a smart pace. It was already getting towards dusk when he reached the first fringe of trees and plunged without hesitation into the wood, looking anxiously on either side for any sign of his friend. Here and there wicked little faces popped out of holes but vanished immediately at sight of the valorous animal, his pistols and the great ugly cudgel in his grasp, and the whistling and pattering, which he had heard quite plainly on his first entry, died away and ceased, and all was very still. He made his way manfully through the length of the wood to its furthest edge. Then, forsaking all paths, he set himself to traverse it, laboriously working over the whole ground, and all the time calling out cheerfully, Molly, 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 where are you? It's me, it's old rat. He had patiently hunted through the wood for an hour or more, when at last, to his joy, he heard a little answering cry. Guiding himself by the sound, he made his way through the gathering darkness to the foot of an old beech tree with a hole in it, and from out of the hole came a feeble voice saying, Ratty, is that really you? The rat crept into the hollow, and there he found the mole exhausted and still trembling. Oh, rat, he cried, I've been so frightened you can't think. Oh, I quite understand, said the rat soothingly. You shouldn't really have gone and done it, mole. I did my best to keep you from it. We river bankers, we hardly ever come here by ourselves. Now then, we really must pull ourselves together to make a start for home while there's still a little light left. It'll never do to spend the night here. Here, Ratty, said poor Mo. I'm dreadfully sorry, but I'm simply dead beat, and that's a solid fact. You must let me rest here a little longer and get my strength back if I'm to get home at all. Oh, all right, said the good-natured Rat. Rest away. It's pretty nearly pitch dark now, anyhow. There ought to be a bit of a moon later. So the mole got well into the dry leaves and stretched himself out and presently dropped off into sleep, though of a broken and troubled sort, while the rat covered himself up too, as best he might, for warmth, and lay patiently waiting with a pistol in his paw. When at last the mole woke up, much refreshed and in his usual spirits, the rat said, Now then, I'll just take a look outside and see if everything's quiet, and then we really must be off. He went to the entrance of their retreat and put his head out. Then the mole heard him saying quietly to himself, Hello, hello, here is a go. What's up, Ratty? asked the mole. Snow is up, replied the rat briefly, or rather, down. It's snowing hard. Well, well, it can't be helped. We must make a start and take our chance, I suppose. The worst of it is I don't exactly know where we are, and now this snow makes everything look so very different. It did indeed. The mole would not have known that it was the same wood. 
However, they set out bravely and took the line that seemed most promising. An hour or two later, they had lost all count of time. They pulled up, dispirited, weary and hopelessly at sea, and sat down on a fallen tree trunk to recover their breath and consider what was to be done. There seemed to be no end to this wood, and no beginning, and no difference in it, and worst of all, no way out. We can't sit here very long, said the rat. We shall have to make another push for it and do something or other. He peered about him and considered. And look here, there's a sort of dell down here in front of us, where the ground seems all hilly and humpy and hummocky. We'll make our way down into that and try and find some sort of shelter, and there we'll have a good rest before we try again. Besides, the snow may leave off, or something may turn up. So once more they got on their feet and struggled down into the dell, where they hunted about for a cave or some corner that was dry and a protection from the keen wind and the whirling snow. Suddenly the mole tripped up and fell forward on his face with a squeal. Oh, my leg, he cried. Oh, my poor chin. And he sat up on the snow and nursed his leg in both his front paws. Poor old mole, said the rat kindly. You don't seem to be having much luck today, do you? Let's have a look at the leg. Yes, you've cut your shin, sure enough. Wait till I get in my handkerchief, and I'll tie it up for you. I must have tripped over a hidden branch or a stump, said the mole miserably. Oh, my, oh, my. It's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it attentively. That was never done by a branch or a stump. Looks as if it was made by a sharp edge of something in metal. Funny. He pondered a while and examined the humps and slopes that surrounded them. Well, never mind what done it, said the mole, forgetting his grammar in his pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after carefully tying up the leg with his handkerchief, had left him and was busy scraping in the snow. Suddenly the rat cried, Hooray! and then, hooray, 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 and fell to executing a feeble jig in the snow. What have you found, Ratty? asked the mole, still nursing his leg. Come and see, said the delighted rat as he jigged on. The mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good look. Well, he said at last slowly, I see it right enough, a door scraper. Well, what of it? Why dance jigs around a door scraper? But don't you see what it means, you you dull-witted animal? Of course I see what it means. It simply means that some very careless and forgetful person has left his door scraper lying about in the middle of the wild wood, just for it's sure to trip everybody up. Very thoughtless of him, I call it. Oh, dear, oh, dear, cried the rat. Here, stop arguing and come and scrape. And he set to work again and made the snow fly in all directions around him. After some further toil, his efforts were rewarded and a very shabby doormat lay exposed to view. There! What did I tell you? exclaimed the rat in great triumph. Now, not another word, but scrape! Scrape and scratch and dig and hunt around, especially on the side of the hummocks, if you want to sleep dry and warm tonight, for it's our last chance! The rat attacked a snowbank beside them with ardour, probing with his cudgel everywhere, and then digging with fury. And the mole scraped busily too, more to oblige the rat than for any other reason, for his opinion was that his friend was getting light-headed. Some ten minutes' hard work, and the point of the rat's cudgel struck something that sounded hollow. He worked till he could get a paw through and feel, then call the mole to come and help him. Hard at it went the two animals, till at last the result of their labours stood full in view. In the side of what had seemed to be a snowbank stood a solid-looking little door painted a dark green. An iron bell pull hung by the side, and below it, on a small brass plate, neatly engraved in square capital letters, they could read by the aid of moonlight, Mr. Badger. While the rat attacked the door with his stick, the mole sprang up at the bell pull, clutched it, and swung there, both feet well off the ground, and from quite a long way off, they could faintly hear a deep-toned bell respond. They waited patiently for what seemed a very long time, stamping in the snow to keep their feet warm. At last they heard the sound of slow, shuffling footsteps approaching the door from the inside. 
It seemed, as the mole remarked to the rat, like someone walking in carpet slippers that were too large for him and down at heel, which was intelligent of mole because that was exactly what it was. There was a noise of a boat shot back, and the door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy, blinking eyes. Now the very next time this happens, said a gruff and suspicious voice, I shall be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time? Disturbing people on such a night. Speak up. Oh, badger, cried the rat. Let us in, please. It's me, rat, and my friend Mole, and we've lost our way in the snow. What? Ratty, my dear little man, exclaimed the badger in quite a different voice. Come along in, both of you, at once. Why, you must be perished. Well, I never lost in the snow, and in the wild wood, too, and at this time of night, but come in with you. The two animals tumbled over each other in their eagerness to get inside, and heard the door shut behind them with great joy and relief. The badger, who wore a long dressing gown, and whose slippers were indeed very down at heel, carried a flat candlestick in his paw, and had probably been on his way to bed when the summons sounded. He looked kindly down on them and patted both their heads. This is not the sort of night for small animals to be out, but come along, come into the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire there and supper and everything. He shuffled on in front of them, carrying the light, and they followed him, nudging each other in an anticipating sort of way down a long, gloomy, and to tell the truth, decidedly shabby passage, into a sort of central hall, out of which they could dimly see other long tunnel-like passages branching. There were doors in the hall as well, stout, oaken, comfortable-looking doors. One of these the badger flung open, and at once they found themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large, firelit kitchen. The floor was well-worn red brick, and on the wide hearth burned a fire of logs. In the middle of the room stood a long table of plain boards, placed on trestles with benches down each side. At one end of it, where an armchair stood pushed back, were spread the remains of the badger's plain but ample supper. Rows of spotless plates winked from the shelves of the dresser, and from the rafters overhead hung hams, bundles of dried herbs, nets of onions, and baskets of eggs. It seemed a place where heroes could fitly feast after victory, or where two or three friends of simple tastes could sit about as they pleased and eat and smoke and talk in comfort and contentment. The kindly badger thrust them down on a settle to toast themselves at the fire and bade them remove their wet coats and boots. Then he fetched them dressing gowns and slippers and himself bathed the mole's shin with warm water and mended the cut with sticking plaster till the whole thing was just as good as new, if not better. When at last they were thoroughly toasted, the badger summoned them to the table. Conversation was impossible for a long time, and when it slowly resumed, it was that regrettable sort of conversation that results from talking with your mouth full. The badger did not mind that sort of thing at all, nor did he take any notice of elbows on the table, or everybody speaking at once. As he did not go into society himself, he had got an idea that these things belonged to the things that didn't really matter. He sat in his armchair at the head of the table and nodded gravely at intervals as the animals told their story, and he did not seem surprised or shocked at anything. End of Disc 1